So that's where I think the real treat is when it comes to having your immediate market right outside your front door. And that's tough to beat uh, when you look at both the access to expertise and the willingness for fostering egg tech companies. Welcome to Startup Bill, the show where we discuss what it's like to build a tech startup and a startup ecosystem in a small city. I'm your producer, Ariel Delory. Our host is Mike Wilsfeld, and today we're joined by the co-founder and CEO of Dark Horse Egg Ventures, Tyler Lovely. Dark Horse Egg Ventures took home the grand prize at Cool Launch X finale and has been accepted into the second cohort of Cultivator's Egg Tech Accelerator, which is launching this week in Regina, Saskatchewan. Dark Horse Egg Ventures developed a precision egg platform to address the struggles farmers and agronomy businesses have collecting and processing data with the backing of acclaimed experts in digital egg and crop science. We chat with Tyler about connecting the dots in the egg industry, leveraging universal layers of data to make scalable products that they can apply globally, and their experiences going through a couple of Saskatchewan's incubator accelerator programs. Welcome to Startup Bill. The Startup Bill podcast is brought to you by Innovation Saskatchewan. Tyler Lefley of Dark Horse Egg Ventures. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. So before we get into Dark Horse and the company in itself, uh, tell me a little bit about you. How did you get into the egg space? Uh, what's the, the Tyler origin story? Oh boy, <laughs> origin story. It's kind of crazy thinking that I went to do my egg degree. I loved uh, you know, biology and chem in high school and as well had family farm or extended family farms that really enjoyed my time uh, there growing up. I thought I was going to be in the oil field <laughs> doing reclamation work in Alberta or in the mountains. And once the oil crashed halfway through that degree, switched over to plant genetics and essentially did two um, capstone projects to prove that I could do a master's uh, for plant sciences. Carried on with that and f- honestly fell back on my egg degree after uh, finishing my master's because. Gene editing was kind of uh, not mainstream. So yeah, it, everything just kind of fell back on that uh, in terms of like origin story of how I've more or less gotten to where I am today. That's interesting. So you you and I have something in common. I I also went into uh, to university thinking I was getting into the oil and gas mining sector. Uh, graduated during the crash. Uh, so that's 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 how I ended up in tech, and I'm and I'm glad I'm in here. So and we're glad that this this. Uh, this uh, turn of events ended up with you in the ag tech space as well. So tell me, tell me more about Dark Horse Egg. Um, what's the company? What do you guys do? Give me the the quick elevator pitch. Oh yeah, for sure. So essentially, uh, Dark Horse Egg is a precision agriculture uh, technology company that specializes in something called variable rate. And so, through mapping nutrient use efficiency and water use efficiency, we married them together to create something that um, is able to produce real-time nutrient recommendations and as well the, uh, the zones that those recommendations get applied to. And so this is no longer something that you know, is the static map that everyone does variable read off of. We're doing real-time uh, now. So that's where Dark Horse comes into, into action. That's awesome. So um, are, you, are you on the field working with farmers now with, with- with your technology? Uh, yeah, so we're doing a lot of product demos uh, coming up. So, of course, well, not in the field, I guess, this winter. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah but, absolutely. But yeah, um, even past, I was a consulting agronomist uh, as well. So that's where I got a lot of my boots on the ground experience in that aspect for what can be approved with this type of technology and where we're going. Because uh, a, st- a static map, how is that going to adapt to you know changes in moisture? And it hasn't been able to until, um, I guess, what we got going on now. I think other people have modeled the water, but it's just a matter of also modeling and creating that real-time aspect of those recommendations. Mm -hmm. So the the real-time recommendation thing being the real game changer here, I think you have a a really interesting and unique perspective in the startup space. I mean, encounter a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and startups that are looking to innovate in the egg space um not always from an egg background though right and and so you're coming from a place where you know you have some background in egg and agronomy you're working with farmers in the field 
Um, if you could kind of summarize like quickly, like what is, you know, what is the, the big reason for, for sort of the marriage of technology and, and, uh, and insights in the field here? Um, cause I know sometimes we can just, you know, throw a layer of technology over top of things and, you know, try and sell that to farmers, um, who are out there every day and they go, you know what, this, this isn't super useful for me. What's sort of the, the key that makes this, you know, a big difference maker for the farmers that you're working with? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the big difference maker here is that it's, it's a matter of connecting the dots and a lot of it's, that's a very difficult thing to do or a skill to have in the ag industry from what um, I've seen and what my peers have seen as well. And that's where it comes from my, I think in my experience, I kind of have a special ability in that aspect because I've done gene editing, reproductive biology, the hardcore, you know, agronomy, soil science degree background. Now I'm actually doing my PhD where I'm uh, uh, breeding triticale to be on my system. So I just kind of followed all the way from the lab to the field. I've been able to connect a lot of dots and being able to know what farmers want out of that. There's a matter of generalization where I think a lot of people that don't have the ability to connect those dots and generalize a lot of concepts struggle with um, adoption and getting that technology on the farm because it's too intricate and a lot of things, you know, they don't have to be there. Uh, it can be a, as simple as one click of a button instead of having to be an hour process of reading a manual. Cool. Cool. So I'd love to hear more about sort of the grand vision. I mean, in, in Canada, there's, we, we talk a lot about broad acre far farming. That's kind of the, the, the big thing here. You know, obviously there's agri agriculture all over the world. Um, you know, a lot of companies that we work with, you know, try and build globally competitive ag businesses. Is this something that can apply to different types of farming or is it more specific to kind of the Canadian landscape and, and how we, how we do it here? Uh, it's actually like not geographically limited um, with what we're doing because of how we're doing it. <laughs> and it's, we're using a layer of, of uh, a map layer that farmers produce around the world. It's called yield data um, that creates yield maps. And it's the second most adoptive or adopted precision ag technology out there behind auto steer and GPS. And every uh, new combine has, has it as a standard feature. So we are really leveraging this um, universal layer of data to fuel our entire ecosystem of products that we've created. And from that, that makes it now a scalable uh, product, independent product and both product ecosystem um, that, you know, we can globally apply because and when you, when you look at row crops, yes, they are universal. You can, you know, wheat's <laughs> produced in all many countries around the world. It's just a matter of, I think, uh, going beyond your crops. That's where, you know, there will be some more research and development on that aspect. But right now we are, we're staying in our lane on row crops as, uh, as a startup. It's, it's, it's a real, um, it's a matter of focus. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And obviously Canada is a great place to, to focus early because there's, just, there's just so much of it going on. Um, so switching gears a little bit more to the, the entrepreneurship side of your story, uh, you recently participated in the CoLaunch X cohort from uh, from CoLabs and and CoLabs is or Innovation Saskatchewan is obviously great, uh, a proud supporter of, of CoLabs and their programs. And I know uh, the this new CoLaunch X cohort they changed up a few things. Tell me a little bit about your experience going through that that program. I, I guess start start with you know. You, you get that acceptance email, you're, you're in the program. How do you feel about it? And then, and tell me about uh, what it was like kind of going through this, this newly adapted program for early stage startups. Yeah, for sure. So I do not have like any real information of how they changed it up. Cause I don't have like previous experience from, you know, past programs. So that's with, with putting that aside, the collabs program, man, that pushed me. <laughs> it was, uh, I came in and I was about uh, as much as a, of, a, of a rookie you could get when it comes to entrepreneurship and getting a matter of my ideas simplified. Cause I think that's something that where I was having to transfer literally my way of thinking and academia 
uh, going to the farmer and then finding a happy medium when it comes to presenting a collapse. And I was doing that all within, you know, a matter of hours. <laughs> and <laughs> it took a lot of calibration and, and, and obviously work when it came down to it. And the coaches that they have really pushed you. Like I wasn't spending, you know, one to three hours a week on this stuff. This was almost like a part-time job mm -hmm. when it came down to uh, nailing the, I guess, basics and then working on further working on the fundamentals, because I think a lot of the, the work you got put in the work as just part of it. And even if I, if I didn't get uh, the results, which obviously was a treat winning because it's, it's, it's a really good feeling when all that hard work pays off. But even if, if, if I ended up, um, you know, being a runner up or even further getting cut in the first or second round of the overall uh, cohort, then you come away with a lot of learning and it's just a matter of picking up where you left off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, so you went through this program, uh, kind of learned how to nail the basics of, of, of being a startup founder, found success in there, obviously uh, won, won some prize money at the, at the finale pitch competition. Now you're, you're involved in a new program um, you noticed with, uh, with Cultivator and their ag tech accelerator. Uh, tell me, tell me what that experience is like and, and tell me what, what is kind of like the next stage for dark horse ag that you're looking to get out of a program like this um, to kind of level up what you learned uh, from the co-launch cohort. Yeah, for sure. So it's been obviously a treat to, get to go from uh, collabs and then go into the Ag Tech Accelerator. But even before that, actually, in October, we were part of Cultivator's start program. Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking about putting in the work and, and a matter of, you know, seeing, seeing the results, we did not uh, even get any, we did not uh, place it all in terms of the Cultivator's start uh, program. So just kept on working and working and going through collabs. And now I think that work is definitely showing when it comes to the Ag Tech Accelerator. And it's, it's an awesome feeling to be recognized within, uh, you know, the top 16 companies that a lot of people uh, believe in, in terms of the technology and the scalability. Uh, so when it comes to um, the Accelerator, I think it will really help us when it comes to scaling our product, like everything's automated behind the scenes. Now it's a matter of building it <laughs> uh, because there's been a lot of uh, proof of concept and hammering away on independent products. And we got some extra bells and whistles on top of our main technology. So now it's a matter of scaling. And I think that's obviously going to be uh, a big part when the coaching comes in at Tech Accelerator. And as well with recent news um, about SVB, um, now I'm uh, stuck reading, you know, all these books behind me in terms of looking at uh, venture venture capital strategies and, and further making sure that um, our team is in place to be able uh, to go after building this platform that we have. Yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting curveball thrown us. So for context on the recording, this will be released about a week after we're recording. But yeah. this is the Monday after the the Friday uh, in which Silicon Valley Bank um, uh, was folded by by the FDIC and and is going to have ripple effects across the venture capital and startup ecosystem. Obviously, a different kind of effect in Canada, but but will still potentially affect the uh, the fundraising and 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 ability for growth here. Um, yeah. So one of the things I'd love to touch on is, is one of the greatest challenges that in ag tech from founders I've talked to talk to is, is the, the seasonal sales cycle. Um, so we're in March here, we're headed into the spring. Um, I'd love to learn like what you're kind of looking forward to as farmers kind of hit the fields again. Is this another, you know, uh, build and refine, um, you know, get some product in farmers' hands and beta test some things, or are you ready to, are you looking to kind of hit the ground and, and get some sales and, and start to scale things up this summer? Um, or are you going to look at fundraising? I'd, I'd love to see how kind of where you're headed going into the, the growing season this year. <laughs> yeah. So it's almost like a trifecta approach because now I think a lot of egg tech based on where things have gone with, a lot of these giants in the ecosystem and it's there's a lot of trust that has been burned when it comes to dealing with farmers and egg tech 
so it's a matter of rebuilding that trust and that's where it's like okay we're not going to go and you know full force slides here it's, it's about building up the trust uh because when a farmer has a product that they trust and they know they can depend on that's when you have uh, the repeat sales cycle so um, strategy number one we're doing a lot of product demos like if there's farmers out there we're, we're ready to do uh three fields um when it comes to uh using our nutrient efficient nutrient efficiency maps you know just to see them get a feel for it and let them uh, know what they think and then you know revisit them later when it comes to uh, sampling in the fall or even other agronomists that want to uh, test things out because we have channel partners so our go-to-market is being through uh, consulting agronomists uh, more actively because obviously they they deal with a lot more acres than a uh, single farmer but we're definitely uh, willing to or we are <laughs> dealing with both. So um, when it comes to that, like the tech is there, we've proven it. We are, we already have uh, maps from this past year as well. And a lot of our, our data is based off the farm and we look at historic trends. And so it's not like it's a one-off map that's you know gonna have significant correction. This is based off like historic data and that Data tells the stories when you look at there's power in numbers. The more repetitions you have, the better. And so just look at that in terms of history. Right. So, uh, yeah, when it comes to fundraising, that'll be uh, later in the summer, uh, going into the fall here. And so right now it's a matter of actually switching our strategies because everyone's done their plans for seeding pretty much. Um, if you are, then you're kind of hitting the panic button and you don't want to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that means we got to focus our shift in terms of sales marketing to uh, fungicide applications for variable rate maps. In terms of seasonality in North America, that is something we want to address by going uh, international. So we're looking for uh, doing demo maps in Australia, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, and just other areas of the world that have different cropping seasons than us. And so that's how you, that's how we are buffering risk. Um, but of course there's language barriers that we're looking to address there and fill those gaps. Awesome. So, so you mentioned two things that I'd love to touch on some more, explore a little deeper is one is that, that trust element. Um, and the other in, in this, in, in expanding internationally and, and engaging with, with other regions. So, and I think they go hand in hand, right? I mean, I've, I've talked to farmers before, even early adopting farmers that, that have been early to, to bring in new technologies to their operations. And you mentioned it as well as, is they've been burned in the past, right? Is, you know, sort of, uh, other products that, have, you know, they put a layer of technology over something that, you know, is maybe easier done, um, you know, with boots on the ground or, or other things like that, that are really just sort of a superfluous, you know, pretty little doodad that doesn't, you know, meaningfully impact a farmer's time or, or, or production resources. Um, so tell me about how you're going about solving that problem of trust and building trust with the farmers and the agronomists, and then maybe expand on that if in looking to, to other regions, you know, you got ling language barriers, cultural barriers, uh, you know, maybe different ways entirely that farms are operated. Um, how are you going about um, sort of solving this trust problem with, with potential customers? Yeah, for sure. So I think part of the trust is A, does it line up agronomically? And then B, uh, is it cost efficient? It makes sense. Is it, you know, simple, quick, accessible uh, to the farmer? Because you need those two things to make sense in terms of, yes, I'll purchase this product for my farm. All of our products, very cost efficient. Um, it's crazy to think like not even 10 years ago, guys were charging, you know, three bucks an acre for yield cleaning. We're charging 50 cents with an added bonus of correcting it with satellite imagery. <laughs> <And> <laughs> it's, it's just a matter of, of how the industry has, has developed over the years, honestly. But when it comes to uh, building that trust, agronomically, um, our products do line up because uh, we actually work in a bit of a different way. So our philosophy is that uh, a lot of the industry is measuring independent factors that uh, correlate to yield. Uh, we kind of we work in reverse. So we're apps, we're dealing with yield exclusively 
and working backwards um, in that aspect. And so when you're looking at agronomically uh, checking out, yield is what you're marketing, yield is what you're taking off the field, yield is what's in those, those the data points in that uh, in that harvester that it's, it's collecting. And it's farmer owned. You can't, <laughs> um, uh, something that's more scalable and simple as that, I think it's definitely um, the easiest way to go and it makes the product overall cost efficient due to um, less inten- uh, intensive resources being dedicated to it. Right. Yeah. And on the, on the cost efficiency piece, um, you mentioned something interesting there that, you know, a lot of, a lot of founders struggle with is, is pricing their product. You mentioned, you know, you're charging 50 cents an acre for a product or a service that used to, that farmers are used to paying $3 for. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd love to learn more about how you arrived at that number and, and how you're kind of approaching pricing moving forward to make sure that you're, you know, striking that balance between, you know, maximizing your own margin, your own returns while still adding, adding value and ROI for the farmers and, and still making that, making it that, um, that of course, um, decision for the farmers, right? Where, you know, of course I would go with this because I'm getting more for less. Uh, let's learn more about how you're, how you're approaching that. Yeah, for sure. And so at the end of the day, I think a lot of preaching has been done when it comes to product pricing. Uh, you want to have your price set at, uh, what, what is it? I believe a 10 X factor in terms of the actual benefit. Um, farmers usually like to, they're a bit different. So if something, uh, it comes back to uh, cost return ratios for them. And they're actually a fair bit lower than a lot of uh, like B2B SaaS products out there. And so it's a bit different. And I have, that's where the experience comes in from the consulting uh, side of things. Cause as well, you know, we've done our research with uh, even other competitors and agronomy uh, businesses throughout Western Canada to a point where we've got it uh, fairly narrowed down in terms of uh, having a competitive product on the market. And so, and as well, um, by having a competitive product on the market, we've added more bells and whistles to it. So um, when it comes down uh, to the pricing, farmers like to deal with uh, anywhere from a three to one is their lowest re- uh, return to cost ratio. So if they're spending two dollars, they want a minimum of six bucks back. Mm-hmm. And so if you're looking at that, we've actually uh, more or less blown that out of the water. And so I think that's part of where it builds more of the trust mm-hmm. and the fact that this is uh, scalable. Yeah. And so that's my opinion. Looking at it as well, you know, we have our, our senior advisors on our team too that have been in the industry collectively over uh, eighty years and high positions. Uh, with Bayer and even uh, the Agatrend Agronomy Network. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of background experience uh, of running, creating the clockwork here. Awesome. And you've, and you've given me the, the perfect segue into my last question here is is on that network, on those advisors, the the people who um, understand this industry inside and out. I'd love I'd love to get your thoughts on on building this company in Saskatchewan and and what you think are the advantages of you building this company in an early stage in this province um, and then for the next stages of the business and scaling things up. In terms of Saskatchewan, obviously it's the largest uh, base of farmland uh, in Canada here. And so that's where I think the real treat is when it comes to having your immediate market right outside your front door. Mm -hmm. And that's tough to beat uh, when you look at both the access to expertise and the willingness for fostering egg tech companies uh, from both uh, industry, VCs, doesn't matter, you know, even government. Uh, but it's just a matter of, you know, finding those connections. And it's great to be, you know, in honestly, one of the, probably uh, the best agriculture colleges in, the, in, in Canada here in terms of resources. So there's no sort of shortage of help just around the corner. It's just a matter of, you got to be willing to, you know, knock on the door and make people, I guess, are in their, are in their pay. Professors aren't there just to sit on their computer all day kind of deal. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And I mean, you know, at Startup Phil here on the podcast, we're all about connecting people, <laughs> all about uh, expanding those networks. And and on that note, we'll close things off today, but we always like to make sure that people can get in touch with our guests that are on the show. So uh, Tyler, how can people get in touch with you uh, if they're interested in reaching out? 
Yeah, for sure. So we have Twitter, we got LinkedIn uh, as well. You can uh, check out our website, dhadventures.com and uh, get in contact uh, with myself or my co-founder, Garrett, from there. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. Startup Bill is brought to you by Innovation Saskatchewan, helping grow the tech sector in our province and beyond. Our show is produced by me, Ariel Delorier, and our host, Mike Rosefeld. Our theme music is from GG Riggs and Reactor Productions. Learn more about us and our guests at innovationsask.ca slash startupville. Don't forget to review wherever you listen to podcasts. It really helps us rise up the ranks. See you next time on Startup Bill.